Awesome. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I recognize a couple of you I bumped into yesterday at um, the Rare Founders event. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I'm Beth. I am currently the Director of Growth at Flexo, which is a HR tech startup. Um, and I've been there for about a year. That is my third um, kind of growth lead, head of growth role that I've been in. I've also done... Um, D 2 C fintech, and I've done um, B 2 B marketing tech as well, and then I'm also a growth coach and advisor. So I work with founders or people who want to be a head of growth or who um, are a kind of new head of growth to try and help them figure out what their strategy should be. And a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted to see everything from the other side of the table as well. So I started angel investing. And that's actually been amazingly helpful for me because being in growth makes me a better angel investor because I'm able to talk to the founders on a different, more operational level than a lot of uh, VCs can. And also being an investor makes me better at growth because I know what the investors are looking for when when and if we're raising money or any of the, the startups I'm working with are raising money. So hopefully I can be helpful. Definitely. Um, we're going to start by kind of just setting the scene with top of the funnel metrics, I think. So for anyone here that isn't quite sure what they should be measuring, um, can you just talk through what top of the funnel metrics are compared to measuring revenue, for example, and then why it's important to kind of look towards what's going on at the beginning of the customer journey? Yeah, so... Revenue is is the default thing that people measure a lot of the time, and that doesn't always make sense. And the reason for that is it's really difficult to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to make some money today. I'm going to go and do some revenue, right? That's a really like, what do you go and do? That you have to do something else, be good at something else, which will then lead to revenue. Revenue is it's an output metric. It's not a metric that you can directly work on. So whenever I'm um, building out growth models, which is essentially a map of your, of your funnel and of your business and all of the activities that you're doing, where you're able to identify, oh, if I focus here, then it's going to have a knock-on effect down the line, right? So, and, and I can guarantee you it's not going to be revenue. Your most important metric will not be revenue. It'll be something else. The reason why top of funnel metrics make most sense to focus on, honestly, I think at any point in a business, but um, there are some situations further down, if you've got huge churn, for example, that you might focus on that. But most of the time, top of funnel metrics are more truth telling than um, bottom of funnel metrics. So a lot more complexity going on down there that, that's hard to, to cut through. So um, an example of that is that most people who think they have a churn issue actually have an activation issue, which is way higher up in the funnel. It's not really much you can do when your customers start leaving. We've all had those emails that say, come back, we'll give you a discount or things like this, but they're not very effective. You actually need to be working on your, um, your metrics much higher up. So the way that I would break that down is top of funnel is things like number of social followers, number of new customers, um, number of leads, everything that's kind of pre-conversion. So whatever that conversion is for you, if you're B2B, it might be after a three month enterprise sales cycle. If you're D2C, it might be after a 20 minute Instagram to uh, e-commerce transition, right? You, you, your, your funnel will be um, different lengths depending on your business. But I consider top of funnel to be everything until and including that, that point of conversion um, if you're a tech product. Uh, and then you've got that. So someone buys something, you've got sales, right? That's your kind of transition into the middle of funnel. Your middle of funnel is then things like onboarding, activation, getting people to, to kind of actually use the product. Much harder if you're a physical product. If anyone does have a physical product, let me know and I can do it for that as well. And then bottom of funnel is that ongoing kind of um, 
engagement, continued use, weekly active users, those kind of things. And there's kind of no point looking at weekly active users if you've only got three customers or if you've frankly got under like 100 customers. It's just not really going to be anything that's going to change your business. Your, your, the most um, value you're going to get for your time at this stage is definitely going to be in that top of funnel up until that moment of, of sale. Is that I know you were just talking about angel investing, linking in with growth and growth to angel. When you're looking at a pitch deck as an angel investor, if people are talking about on the metric slide or they're talking a bit about their traction, does that mean that you react slightly differently if you see top of the funnel metrics at that point versus, I don't know, we've got X amount of daily active users or we've got X amount of revenue? Yeah, because um, they're just not going to be that impressive. If I look at a pitch deck, so I invest pretty early stage. So usually within the first 500 to a million that someone's going to raise, like that's where I really like to to work. And it's it's good to see if people have, have revenue, right? Because it shows that there are people willing to, to pay for this. But it's probably going to be pretty insignificant in the in the grand scheme of things and definitely in the in the kind of hopes of where you're trying to get this to um when i'm looking at metrics from an angel investing perspective what i'm really trying to trying to figure out is do you understand your business and do you understand the different metrics that will contribute to your success so if you've copied kind of basic formula and put equal weighting on on all of those metrics and really dug into revenue for example or weekly active users when that's not really that that crucial to your business then that would worry me whereas if you're going well actually we've got a um we've got x many hundreds of thousands of pounds if you're b2b in the pipeline these are people we've gone out we've spoken to and we know about and we've interviewed 30 people and we've um we've spoken to another hundred people and this is how many outbounds we send and that's uh it's a real indicator of of activity and speed for me those top of funnel metrics which is why I think they're so important yeah actually what well, at this point um can you all put in the chat what is if you had to focus on just one metric what metric you're you're focused on right now just so we can get an idea of what people are um are most interested in knowing about their own business um can I explain I... that that one metric thing a little bit is that okay if I talk about that rate limiting step yeah yeah aspect. so I think like what Purdy's saying about having one metric is is really interesting and the reason for that is that your the metrics that you need to look at will have a hierarchy so we talk about this, um, a metric, you might have heard the term North Star metric, right? A lot of people will pick revenue for their um, North Star metric. But your North Star metric should be the moment of value exchange between you and the customer, right? So at Flexa, we have businesses on our platform who are promoting their employer brand, trying to build up their um, recruitment marketing efforts, right? And we have people who are looking for jobs and companies that they might want to join. We don't do job applications. If we did, that would be our North Star metric. What we do is company saves. So a, a user, an individual can save a company to receive updates from them as and when they're hiring for a role relevant to them. That's our North Star metric. So everything else in our business levels up to that metric. That is post revenue for us. It's not, it's, it doesn't generate us any more money, the more company saves we have, but it is a really good indicator of, are we providing what we set out to provide to our marketplace? So both of our customers, and that is a great indicator of, is this sustainable and will it come back? Right? So you have this North star metric at the top, which really really it's about value exchange right is that the moment where someone gets value or enjoyment or use from your product are they solving their problem with it might not be day one might be day 90 if you were a fitness app for example then underneath that you have key drivers so what are the 
key things that you can do to change that number, right? So again, if I use us as an example, for us to have more company saves, we kind of need two things to make that happen, right? We need enough companies to be saved and we need enough D to C, we need enough users on the platform who are wanting to save companies. So all of our effort then goes on making those two things happen. And within that, there will always be what we will call a rate limiting step. So this is where you get a little bit more specific. So if you think about your business as um, like a machine or like a set of pipes, there will be one bit of that machine that is narrower than the rest of it and that's causing a blockage. And if you can unblock that, it will have a knock on effect to everything else. So again, for us at Flexa, that's our um, user base, right? So we have 2.2 million users um, who come to Flexa to use, to, to look for companies, but that's still our rate limiting step. And the reason for that is when we speak to companies, companies go, well, how many users do you have? How many people am I gonna get in front of? The more users we have, the more companies we have. The more users we have, the more people will save it. The more users we have, the more um, it knocks on that flywheel effect of, of SEO growth and of social growth, particularly because we're a very, um, talk a lot about flexible working. So we're quite a social um, growth platform. And I know that in my growth team, that if we all laser focus on that rate limiting step or that blockage metric or whatever you want to call it of D to C, acquiring D to C users, then that is going to unblock everything else. And under that, you can get even more granular, right? So for me right now, it's traffic. So I'm pretty confident in my numbers when I look at the metrics that if I can get a hundred users to the site, six to seven percent of them will sign up right that's pretty decent for sign up rates on a, on a website i don't need to go and optimize that if i go and focus on that i might get a one percent gain i'm not interested in one percent gains right as a as a person in growth like it's like 30 percent or more is what's going to get us excited but i absolutely can turn that hundred users into a thousand users and that would have a massive impact, even if that 7% conversion rate stayed the same. So you're really looking for these, these metrics that have a real knock on effect to the rest of your business. And that's why focusing on a single metric might seem a bit narrow focus, but actually it's really not. It, it's, it's unlocking a whole lot of other things around it. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I'm wondering now, whether to bring it to life a bit more, we work through some examples with any volunteers here, um, what you think might be your North Star metric and what, what the drivers are um, that impact the North Star and kind of what blockages you think you might be overcoming. And then Bethy might be able to give some insight if you've got a bit more context. So if you would like to work through it with Beth, just raise your hand. Um, and we'll go through a couple of examples um, rather than just kind of keep focusing on lots of questions. Maddie. Yeah, very happy to be the, the working example. So the company that me and my co-founder Harry is also on the call run is a social discovery at Beth, Beth I know we met yesterday. Um, so it's called Buddy, um, matches people that share the same hobby. Um, so key metric that like automatic and we're pre-revenue as well so key metric that comes to mind would be user growth we launched in january so still quite new so still the sort of laser focus is building that critical mass of users on the app so that the app actually has use for everyone that's on it so you're how how are you naming that as what uh user acquisition or users on the app yeah, users on the app, total users. Total. You've got to be careful how we measure it though, right? Because part of our customer acquisition is paid ads. So it would be misleading to just jack up the ad spend and think that we're doing a great job because we're getting more users. So I think we've got to have some kind of relativity to what we're spending to acquire those customers as well. So not necessarily. Um, or with the paid spend, it would be very, very unusual to be able to get any sort of growth in a D2C 
consumer product without paid spend like that probably is going to be your growth channel um i'd be surprised if it wasn't so so i, I wouldn't get too caught in that um Okay, so let's say that total users number is going up and up and up, right? You're getting 30% growth on your total users number every every single month, and that would be great. Um, how do you know if anyone is enjoying the product or using the product? How do you know they're going to log in ever again? Like, so how, we, is there something so we, there? Yeah, 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 for sure. So we look at like our day one retention, our day seven retention, and then we also look at active messages so we can see if people actually interacting once they're that on the app. I think we would also look at like average time spent on the app per session and the number of different sessions a person might have in a given time period. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason I'm asking this is my worry would be, and and so so metrics have metrics have a dual purpose, right? One of the purpose, which everyone gets really hung up on, um, it's actually not the most important one, is to see how you're going, measure your growth, figure out, um, you know, are things going well or are they not going well? The other purpose is to focus your team and focus your energy. And actually, that's far more important, especially at this stage where I can pretty much guarantee you, you're never going to get more than 80% accuracy on your data tracking anyway. Um, I mean, I look at companies who are doing 30, 40 million in revenue and their data tracking is about 80% accuracy. Um, unless you're a data company, it's really, really hard to get above that. So when you're thinking about, about this, it might feel a bit picky to kind of dig in and really be like, oh, but would that put us in the wrong direction? But you have to remember that this is not just about whether you understand it, it's about whether you can translate that and get your team to understand it. So my fear about total active users as your North Star is that you've got a team of 15 people, let's say fast forward six months, and um, they're all just like plowing everything into total users and nobody is looking anywhere further down the funnel and being able to understand whether they are the right kind of users, right? Traffic is the perfect example of this. If any of you want a uh, hundred thousand traffic next week, I can get that for you. That's not a problem. Like I can do that, right? Just give me the right amount of budget and a couple of creatives and I can get you a hundred K traffic, not an issue. What I cannot do is guarantee you that that traffic is any use to you at all, right? That's the hard bit. And so for you, the, the moment of value of me coming onto your app and going, I really like, because I'm a big golf player, right? I love playing golf. I often play by myself. I've come onto your app and I'm looking for other people who play golf. And um, I log in and there's one other person who's got golf as one of their interests and they look a bit creepy. And so I log off and I come back a week later, still only that one creepy person. Nah, not really that interested. They send me a message and I'm like, mm, it's a bit weird. Don't really know about this. And I log off, right? I would have counted in your user bucket, but I didn't have a good experience and I didn't actually get any value out of that. Whereas if what you'd been measuring, if you have a way to measure this and you definitely should if you don't at the moment, if you can see, oh, Beth and Georgia um, agreed to play golf together and um, after they went, um, we sent them a, did you have a good time thing in the app? And I clicked, yes, would rate Georgia to play golf with. Um, and that's what you were measuring. I've now, I am way more likely to stick around and be a long-term user and eventually be able to be monetized by you because I've had a moment of value exchange. If I never reach that moment, I'm probably, ne I'm probably not going to come back and ultimately not be useful to you. Yeah, definitely. And we were literally having this conversation this morning. It's like, is there a way we can actually measure like real life meetup? Because that's the whole point of the app. How can we, because we can see messages and active messages, but. Um, and there needs to be, there needs to be. Yeah, about physically have people met up and, and how was that? 
I'm going to stop us stop us there. Hopefully that was a useful little tidbit for you too. Um, and Karina, we'll go through your example and then we'll go back to some questions. So much. Um, yeah, so we've got a bit of a different business. So Cookery is a marketplace for families to book uh, inspiring creative nannies and mentors. So we have musicians, actors, dancers. And for us, the value is really to get that repeat business for kids to be exposed to the service for as much as possible. Uh, for families to book more we take a percentage of each hour booked so again that is also translating into revenue and hours booked and um, but we have really seen that shift in offering like the best possible quality at the very best sort of you know the very first time a customer comes in as the best thing for us to do because once they make it essentially if the match is really really good then they're going to book for a very, very long time. Um, but we still technically have revenue as our um, North Star metrics. So um, obviously, I guess activation um, is something that is looking really good for us right now and we're really interested in. But I wonder if there's anything even before then or just anything. Um, yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. And first of all, don't be embarrassed about having revenue as your current target, as most people do. Um, it, it's it's normally not until it gets pointed out that, that people change that. So I think that it sounds like, so there's two things here, right? So we've got North Star metric, which is that kind of overall goal, which it sounds like for you, second bookings or third bookings could be really interesting. And the way that I would track them all, second, third, fourth bookings, and then I would decide which one would be the North Star metric based on predictability. So what you want to do is your North Star metric can then represent, um, we are 80% certain that if somebody books a second session, they will go on to book a fifth session. And, and that will then make them revenue generating for us as a, as a customer. So that would probably be your North Star metric, but or something similar to that, obviously. Um, um, this is a 30 second opinion so take it with a pinch of salt um and then in terms of your um of something earlier in the funnel there could be something really interesting around um like word of mouth referrals or like direct traffic so people who are obviously speaking about it brand search is an interesting one because I think in these communities, particularly communities of parents, there's a lot of um, sharing of, of knowledge and sharing of ideas and help. So that could be really interesting to tap into. Um, but if you're if you're an if you're serving people online, so people purchase through the site, it's probably going to be traffic. Well, probably well, it would be my guess at the I know it's a boring one, but kind of relevant traffic. So you could judge that as um, uh, traffic that state or returning traffic is an interesting one because it's not it's a quite a high consideration product. So it's unlikely that people will buy it on the first time. Returning traffic could be really interesting to look at. That'll probably have higher conversion rates for you. It does. Yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah, thanks for this. That's um, yeah helpful to look at. Karina, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name on the first day, but I've got is it Kelly? Um, you can work through an example as well. Yeah, sure. So our startup is a payments platform and we do cross-border payments. So we would allow you to do payments, say, from the UK into countries in Africa. But then we're also offering digital wallets. So what that meant was if you were going on holiday to um, Kenya on a safari, rather than worry about how you're going to access local cash, we give you a local currency wallet and then you can make payments while you're there in Africa. Um, and I think the key thing is we were still pre-revenue, although I say that because we're loss making. Um, so we've, we've done quite a large chunk of transactions, but compared to our, you know, expenses, we're still not um, making revenue positively. And I think we, we struggle between what to actually track accurately um, as our key metric. So we have customer downloads, um, at least five to 600 new customers every month. But obviously we have some of them falling off with verification because it's a payments app, you have to do KYC and stuff. Um, and so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what, or hear what you think is the most important metric for us, obviously outside of making revenue. 
Yeah, totally. So so first of all, I would describe you guys as um, revenue generating, but pre-profit, um, which also in fintech, by the way, totally normal. I think that some of the massive companies that we all know and uh, maybe like or dislike um, still don't make money. Right. And they can they can be um, close to a decade old. It's very normal in the finance space. Um, so. So you've got two, which is the more popular side of the product, the wallet or the um, international transfers? So we're finding that they're kind of both similar. So you could argue the international transfer is more popular, but only by maybe 5%. Yeah. Um, are they different customers? Are they yes. Very different customer types, yeah. So that that would be the first thing that I'd want to dig into, right? It's unlikely. Um, and again, I this is the first I'm hearing about this product. So if I'm uh if I make any wrong assumptions, I'm sorry. I would assume that people who are using the transfer function either have friends, family, relatives who are already in the country that they are trying to transfer to, right? Because otherwise, why would they be transferring? Whereas people who are using the wallet function, that might not be the case at all. They might be going there on holiday or for a business trip or for many other reasons, as well as that they might have um, friends or relatives in the country that they're looking at. So they're quite different audiences and they're quite different jobs that you're that you're doing for them as a product so i think the first thing i would do is get really clear on that and go and speak to a few of these customers in in each bucket and figure out like you know who are you why are you using this How, what problem does this solve for you like i'm sure there'll be a session on customer interviews or you'll talk about that at some point i know you said you're going to measure those each week um and really understand what they want from it and that I think will help you will help you get a better um, a better understanding. But in the meantime, and if you did want to bunch them together, I'd probably be looking at um, like that value of transactions. Um, so the number of uh, essentially like your version of a loan book, so the the amount of money um, in 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 transition on a weekly or a monthly basis. Um, and then if you're looking higher up the funnel, go and take a look at where these 600 people are coming from. Like that's great um, traction, right? Like 600 people a month is awesome. And where are they coming from? Are they mostly direct? Are they mostly from social media? Is it paid ads? Like, Is it referrals? And whichever one of those is the most popular, I would go and double down on that and, and try and get the most out of it that you can. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so I think one of the things that people will probably want to know is, OK, if they've got a metric, North Star metric that they're focusing on, any tips for how they can grow it? Now, I appreciate that this could be a lot of different things, Beth, but if you can take like a couple of examples of, I don't know, metrics that you've helped people with um, or metrics at Flexa and top tips for how to actually grow that number? Because we're going to be asking founders to uh, report on it every week in the hope that there is some growth. Gosh, okay. Um, so this is going to sound really stupid, but you actually just have to do the work. And I cannot tell you how often people will pay me a not insignificant amount of money for an hour of my time. And I'll come in and I'll look at their growth model and I'll be like, okay, so let's map out your funnel, right? Top to bottom from nobody knows about you. How do they find out about you? How do you convert them? What happens? Cool. Now in the last two weeks, it's actually a really good exercise for everyone to do. Map out your model from they don't know about us. We get them on a paid ad or social media. They then come to our website, mailing list, um nurture sequences conversion activation blah 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 just write that down in the last two weeks what went live to customers what did a customer actually receive or see against each of those steps and you will be amazed at how many times when you actually get someone to sit down I've had people leave the call actually when um when i've made them do this because they um realize they don't do any work um and 
they're like, well, you know, there's a couple of paid ads. And I'm like, and that's it. That's everything that's gone out to a customer in the last two weeks. It sounds really simple, but activity will beat tactics pretty much every single time. You've just got to do the work. Like you can be at 10% as good as another salesperson, but if you do 10 times the work, you'll still win. Like it, activity is one of the most underrated things in, uh, in growth. And I know it sounds really basic and it's a, it is maybe feels a bit patronizing being like, you've just got to do the work. You're obviously all very entrepreneurial, motivated people, otherwise you wouldn't be here doing this, but it's something, especially if you have a team really go and check that out. Like what in the last two weeks actually went out? You'll find that there's a lot of stuff where people have gone, we're going to have a look at um, nurture sequences and they will be looking at nurture sequences for three weeks and nothing's actually going out and, and being delivered to customers. So that's the, the biggest thing. Check your activity levels, really check your activity levels. Um, and then the other thing I think would be to try and establish a process of experimentation as quickly as you can whilst also realizing that not everything needs to be an experiment. So when I talk about experiments in growth, what we mean by that is um, finding a problem or finding an area of the business that's really, really relevant to that rate limiting step or that blockage or our North Star metrics. So we're, we're focusing in the right place already. Um, and then, um, so like I could run an experiment at Flexa that would be, um every instead so at the moment we have quite like a um a low push sign up process for for candidates coming onto the site for users coming onto the site i don't force them to give me their details i don't force them to sign up to be able to see jobs i don't i don't make them do that right because we know that that's the better way how we know that is because we ran an experiment where we forced them to do it we gated the entire website for two weeks and it did not go well, right? It, it did not go well because people were like, I don't know who you are, I don't trust you, I'm not ready to give you all this information. And so we changed it back. But what could have happened is I could have changed my 7% conversion rate to 50% conversion rate. And then I absolutely would have kept it. So these kind of things where you can sort of push the boundaries of what you're doing and, and be a bit experimental that is really, really interesting to start building as early as you can. Um, and I can send around um, the, like, it's not very fancy, but basically a, a Google Google Sheet that um, I use as our experiment framework, which is basically like, here's my hypothesis. So um, uh, users aren't registering, registering for accounts because they don't understand the value of what they're getting at the end of it. And then under that, I might have five or six or 10 or 20 or however many experiment ideas that we could run on the platform or in the newsletters or on social or wherever it is to, um, to test different, different things and, and see what we can do. Then you work through them one by one and you grade them on like how risky they are. Risky is good. Um, and how hard they are. Easy is good. Like the dream experiment is very risky and very easy. Um, and then you, you know, you learn something every time, right? You, you learn something different, building that attitude and that mindset into your business right from the beginning is way better than getting a team of 15 people. And then being like, now we're going to do scary stuff. That's really, really hard to do unless you're doing it at the beginning and you've got this culture of it's totally fine to fail on the flip side of that. Some things do not need to be an experiment, right? I don't need to run an experiment to see whether if I made the call to action more obvious on an email, more people would click it. Obviously they would. And thousands of people have proven that to be true time and time and time again, right? I don't need to go and do that work. Someone's done it for me. A big thing about growth is, you know, we've got this, kind of a big box right and there's like all this stuff that other people have already figured out 
that I should be copying, you know, making my own contextualizing, but copying all of that best practice, getting to that point and then experimenting from there, right? I'm not going to win by trying to prove out stuff that people already know or the stuff that's obvious, right? I had a team once who wanted to do an experiment that was, would we grow our social audience faster if we posted five times a week instead of three? Not an experiment. Obviously you would, right? That, that it's just That's just how the world works. It's just how the, the platforms work. So I think there's this balance of keeping your activity as high as possible, being experimental and building that culture in, but also cheating where you can, right? There's no point doubling up on work that other people have already done. And you'll find you can get a long way with that. Um, I realize none of that's specific to to any any one metric, but that it, it's quite hard to to do that um, with a with a big group. What um can you just a little bit talk about what you mean by nurture sequencing for anyone that hasn't heard that term before? Yeah, of course. So it's much more um much more important on the B two B side, but there are some D two C products that this is relevant for. So finance would definitely be one of them. Um. No, it, it's essentially like if you think about your customer journey, you either have a low consideration product or a high consideration product. And there's kind of a whole spectrum in between there, right? But are you a £10 water bottle or a £5 hair scrunchie, right? The consideration on a on a fast moving consumer product, very low right? I might buy that. There are some, some um, D2C products where their, their uh, customer journey will be like 20 minutes long, if that, right? It's a real impulse purchase. You don't need to nurture anyone. It's a waste of your time. You need volume. Whereas if you're a high consideration product, and this is things where the customer has to make a behavior change, um, or when it's in a sensitive um, subject, so finance, health, um, anything to do with housing, anything to do with careers, these kind of like much more um, thoughtful purchases, higher consideration purchases, and pretty much everything B2B, you will be in a situation where it's very, very unlikely that the person is going to buy in the first session with you. Session meaning like the first time they come to your website. So in those cases, what you, what you would tend to do as, as kind of the current best practice until someone finds a better way is you optimize for nurture. So I would I want people who are first time visitors, I want to maximize not the number of people who buy the product, it's always an option, but very few will take it. I want to maximize the number of people who agree to be nurtured by me, right, to come into my nurture sequence. So that could be oh, that looks like a cool webinar. I'll sign up to that. Or, oh yeah, that article was really interesting. I'd like their mailing list. Or um, oh, I just took a really cool quiz that um, I had to give you my email to get the results. And I just did this really cool quiz that told me that, you know, I'm a unicorn or whatever things that people do quizzes for online, right? And then I've got them, right? They're in my sphere of influence where I have the ability to, to connect with them. If you are a incredibly low volume, high purchase price, so like 50K and above B2B product, um, you'll want to automate as little of this as you can because the personalization really makes a difference and you can afford to do it because the um, tickets are so big. If you're not that, you're going to want to build um, an automated sequence that you keep iterating on, right? So um, for our, so we, we have a really wide variety of um, contracts on our, that we are B2B contracts at Flexa. Cheapest one is for startups, £950. The most expensive ones are like price on application, but they can be upwards of 100K. We treat those very differently. For our smaller ticket um, companies, so anybody kind of under 10K or under 15K maybe, they will likely download a guide or a lead magnet or a webinar from us. 
And then they will go into a nurture sequence, which is an automated sequence of emails that is segmented to their topic. So they've come in and said, I'm really interested in diversity or I'm really interested in employer branding. And they will get, um, I think ours are on day one, three, five, seven, and 10, I think, series of five emails that is designed to kind of nudge them closer towards us, giving them a bit more information, offering them a bit more value. Oh, you really, you know, you signed up to this webinar. What about this one? Um, and we use HubSpot to lead score them. So you can build a lead scoring system in HubSpot. You can also do this in a spreadsheet um, where they get points for doing different things. If they open my email, if they click on stuff, they get more points. And I end up with a, um, with a list of prioritized leads that I then pass to our sales team who know where to spend their time, right? Someone who's opened all five emails and come to two webinars, much more likely to take a call with the sales team than someone who's ignoring you. So that just really helps us to, um, to focus our efforts. And once they're done with those five emails, they go into um, a, we're still a small team, there's only 17 of us. So we have to prioritize where we spend our time. So after those five emails, they go into a generic weekly newsletter that they get that just kind of keeps us top of mind to them. Um, and then what we track there is our conversion from database, so from mailing list into sales calls. Um, and try and keep that, uh, well, obviously as high as we can, but try and keep it at least a 5% rolling um, kind of roll off of the mailing list into being a, into being a sales call. Um, and people can stay on that mailing list for a long time. Some people convert after a week. Some people take six months. Um, it really varies. Some people never convert. They just sit there and enjoy the content and it's kind of fine for me because maybe they post about us on LinkedIn and give us another um another way to to get more people to. Nice. Um, another kind of tactical question. So you mentioned um that people should write down their whole funnel, and then in the last two weeks, what activity has has taken place at that those different stages of the funnel for founders who are just kind of time poor or trying to prioritize something. Let's say let's say they've done nothing in the past two weeks, but they want to do something in the next two weeks. Is there particular? Is it better to do like one thing at every stage of the funnel, or like double down on top of the funnel? Let's make sure there's like ten things going out, kind of thing. What's what's the best way to manage your time? Yeah, so this is where automation um, becomes your friend. Um, so the first thing before you do anything is um, maybe you've heard that concept of a leaky bucket, right? You don't want to pour in a load of stuff into your bucket if you've got holes all over it and nothing's going to stay so the first thing I would do is go through and look for dead ends if someone came into the top of your funnel now are they going to get stuck anywhere the answer is probably yes um we still find these and the more complicated your um sequences and your marketing and your entry points get the more dead ends you find it's totally normal thing to find, but you want to get rid of them as soon as possible because it's a waste of time and a waste of money. So the first thing I would do is make sure that the entire funnel, you can come through the whole funnel, right? You're not going to get stuck where it's quite common that you'd have a an email capture and then they get a follow-up email and then nothing, right? Nothing after that. When you've got their email address, they should at least be in at minimum a fortnightly um, newsletter or, or something that's going out um, to kind of make them keep them aware of you so for the first thing I would do is to have at least one thing at every part of the funnel so there are no dead ends and it is totally possible for somebody to reach the bottom of your funnel and convert right and then I would look at that rate limiting step question so when you've done this mapping exercise it should be really clear that um, and the, and I go, the way I go through it in my head is that I look at my funnel and all the conversion rates and I go, if I doubled this one, do I care? Right. So like if I let's say I'm a B2B business and I'm getting 50 leads a month and I'm converting them at 10 percent. If I double that, I mean, it's cool, but like 
I'd rather double the the the, the number above, right? I'd rather have a hundred leads a month, right? And and these kind of because that that has more uh, has a higher ceiling, it has more more opportunity, and so you should be able to look through and and figure out which metric, just by modeling it and playing around with the numbers a bit in a spreadsheet. And really understanding which metric is going to have the biggest impact on your whole funnel um, and be really cautious about vanity metrics. So what I said before about like, if you want 100K traffic next week, you can have it. Anyone can have it, right? It's going to cost you about 20p a user. It's really not that hard. It's expensive. It's not hard. And that's a real vanity metric. It's not going to convert into anything useful. And both as a as, a, as someone working in growth and as an angel investor, that's something I really look for in an understanding of, if a founder said to me, or like if, if, if I was in a, you often as an angel, you have like group calls with founders doing, um, that you might be investing in a syndicate. If someone asked, you know, why, why is your, um, why is your social growth, social followers not increasing enough? And the founders were like, yeah, so we looked at that and realized it was a complete vanity metric for us because actually the conversion rate from social followers into website traffic into leads was really low, whereas our outbound, which seems smaller and less scalable, has a, a completely a life-changing um, conversion funnel. Uh, that would impress me so much. It's such a considered understanding of how the numbers affect your business and a really considered approach of this is where we should be spending our time and, and energy because there's always a trade-off. You can never do all of it. That's really useful. Um, if anyone has any direct questions that you want to ask Beth um, or if you want to work through your example, raise your hand. Um, whilst we're doing that, I'll go through a couple of questions that came in on the chat. This is back right at the beginning of when you were speaking, by the way. Um, so when you were talking about um, angel investing, someone said, what's the weight that you use in evaluating the CEO or the founding team, I guess, versus measuring growth or traction? Yeah, so because I invest so early stage, most of it is about the people. Um, but I also think that's a bit of a a, a cop out answer because most investors say that and then they don't that they aren't able to quantify that. And I think that when uh, I I have a completely fluid process of evaluating a deal, right? This is my personal money. It's my time. It's I'm doing it because I'm interested in a company or in a founder. I don't have um, an LP, like I don't have my own investors that I have to, that I have to, you know, justify my decisions to. So I'm in a very different situation to, um, to a VC fund. But for me, I, I weight it, I weight it pretty heavily. And the things that I look for, it, it's three things actually. So the first one is background is, you know, what's this person done before? Um, do they have a, a unique advantage in this space or a competitive advantage in this space? Um, do they have a track record of being ambitious and curious? And that doesn't have to be at work. That could be that they've, you know, done really interesting hobbies or interesting traveling or challenges. It could be lots of different things, especially um, I think a lot of people who are great entrepreneurs don't follow a, a, a traditional career path. Um the second one is, do they make me ask myself an interesting question or something I haven't thought about before? Um, when I, I get a lot, a lot of people are building in the same space, right? So I probably get two mental health apps a week in my inbox. A lot of people are building in that space, right? It's very competitive. And I have the same question every single time I get a mental health app into my inbox, which is when people are suffering from poor mental health, one of the things that really is characteristic of that is a lack of motivation and a lack of proactivity, right? It's really, really hard to drag yourself up and to make a change, a proactive change when you're in that position. And so how are you going to build a D2C growth, or even a B2B growth model that works when the people who you need to reach 
aren't going to be necessarily proactively wanting to do this, right? It's really hard. And nobody has ever sent me a deck or a pitch where I haven't had that question. Whereas the first mental health app that comes into my inbox where they've answered that question for me and they've thought that through and I, and it forces me to go, oh, I can't just default on that thing that I always say no about. That would make me interested in a founder, right? Because I'm like, God, okay, they're, they're a step ahead of me and they're making me, um, me, making me challenge my thoughts. And then the third thing that I look at is the least um, scientific one. And it's normally after I've already met the, met the founder. Um, and this is just a personality match thing, right? Like I do this because I like meeting interesting people and I want to help interesting people build interesting things. So um, this is quite a selfish one. But it's if this person called me at 9 p.m. in the evening, would I go, oh, for God's sake, or would I pick up the phone? And and this happens, right? Like I have founders, I've got five um, founders who I've invested in now, and a couple of them have called me in the evening, um, you know, nervous about something or with a question or they're prepping for a meeting the next day and they just want to talk something over or, you know, something's knocked their confidence and they just need a bit of a pep talk or, you know, sometimes just to be like, hey, how you doing? And a lot of this for me is I'm doing it because I'm enjoying spending time with the people. And so that is a, that's a real test for me, but a not very helpful scientific one. No, that's useful. I think it's always useful to understand what's going on in, in someone's head. Um, this is another question, um, probably very subjective um, for you, but what is your opinion of founders spending their time pitching at events? Do you think if you were an investor, Rare Founders yesterday probably is a good example of this, listening to someone pitching at an event, what's the likelihood that you're actually going to speak to them, take a follow-up meeting and invest? This comes up quite a lot, actually, with founders that like need, need to prioritize their time and they go around pitching at all these events and they don't necessarily see any output, mostly because it's the investors aren't there. Um, but I guess sometimes there are investors there. So what's what's your thoughts on it? Yeah, so I think that's the big one, right? Is and and this is um it makes me embarrassed about investors. Actually, I've been to events before where um you know 50 odd investors had RSVP'd and I'm one of three that show up and it's really embarrassing. I think it's um VCs aren't not doing themselves any favors with the way that they act a lot of the time and yeah I, 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 I do I do find it quite embarrassing there's an arrogance in it that really doesn't sit well with me so that that's definitely one like will there actually be investors there um that said I don't think there's you know if you're a good storyteller like being a founder requires really does require good storytelling and an ability to get people on your side um, there's actually an amazing, it's called the, there's a guy called Marshall Gantz who wrote this, um, it's called The Public Narrative or The Story of Self. Um, it's a really brilliant, it's quite a short essay, but he teaches at Harvard. His classes are hacked, like people sit on the stairs because they can't get in. Um, and it's a really amazing way of, of, of selling yourself and your business and your stories. So if you're looking for some pitch inspiration, he's a great one to look for. Um, so I think that is important practicing um oh well done someone found it already practicing um practicing pitching is really important I think that getting your name out there and being recognized is great I personally wouldn't so yesterday I met a bunch of really interesting nice fun founders not one founder I spoke to yesterday is building in a space where I invest right so that's something to really remember I met some great people but I, at the moment, only invest in climate um, and didn't meet any climate um, climate founders. And um, so that that was not going to be not going to be a place where I was going to going to make any investments. But that doesn't mean that I won't be helpful if I can or, or try and um, or that I think it's a bad exercise. I think what would be. I probably wouldn't spend more than five percent of my time pitching at events. Um unless there's customers there. I think yeah. that that is 
that that's a really interesting place to to spend your time if there are customers of yours there if you are b2b particularly if you're selling to other startups or if you just want the practice public speaking practice is is always worth having yeah um there's someone else that wants to talk to you about um their specific situation but i don't think we're going to be able to get into it in three minutes um I'm just going to go through just to see if you can give any high level enterprise tech. Uh, I don't think there's enough information. Grace, if you're there, can you take yourself off mute and just give kind of like 30 seconds into what you're doing and we'll see whether we can get 30, 60 seconds of feedback. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So my name is, uh, thank you so much. Uh, just a minute. I, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so my name is uh, Grace Almendras Castillo, and I'm a second time uh, venture founder and CEO. I had an exit in 2022 from a digital health company. So my business right now is an organization that is orchestrating all activities of small, medium enterprises in sustainability and impact because there are 300 million small, medium enterprises that by default are actually uh, driving sustainability and impact innovation, but the tools and processes are not accessible to them. It's only accessible to the large enterprises whose main activities are reporting for financial disclosures. So if we want to uh, grow the global economy, we think that small medium enterprises will be a huge source of um, growth for the for an impact economy. So that is our business. It's AI powered, so that it becomes even more accessible to small medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. And how? Wh where do you? How do you get customers at the moment? Um. So our customers, we partner with associations, for example, uh, chambers of commerce or trade associations with small, medium enterprises, which we already know always struggle with capacity and capital. So we partner with them as a source of uh, growth. So it's a partnership channel model. Uh, right now, that's what we're trying to do. We're a new company. We just started uh, in March 2023. So we just uh, hit our first year. But uh, interestingly, while we are here to elevate small, medium enterprises, it's really the funds and governments driving small, medium enterprises that have expressed interest to work with us because we are a platform that will accelerate their ability to grow and support small, medium enterprises. Hmm. Interesting. So I what I what I think would be really helpful is when you do the first growth report that um you're gonna do as part of the program. Um like Purdy, if you could for forward that to me, that would be really helpful. And I think from there I'd be able to understand a bit more of the context and, and then maybe be able to help um help direct a bit more. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's a it's a rather complex business because there are many stakeholders yeah, to drive the growth of small medium enterprises uh, but for us right now our our uh, growth measure is like how are we moving the needle in terms of helping small medium enterprises mm. elevate their impact yeah, yeah. Um, we'll, we'll keep the conversation going um with you grace because i'm conscious of time uh thank well one you. minute which isn't that bad um but beth will um we'll say thank you very much that was really useful so many um, so much inspiration according to the chat and some chat advice um and hopefully everyone's found it useful like i said we're going to chat again on thursday just as a group um to talk through other people's situations and what you think you're going to be measuring and others for feedback and then we'll take the first update on friday so beth we'll see you my team thank you you again um, you if you around for a couple of minutes we'll just talk you through what's going to happen the rest of the week see you, Bye. 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 you.